back, been around the world, literally. Back, first episode of the new year. What's up, man? How's it going? I'm going good. How you doing? Good, man. We're starting off right, just, you know, moving on all cylinders, right? We haven't stopped. You got people setting resolutions. We're like, bro, we've been doing that since last year. That's right, baby. And, so, uh, nah, nah, it feels good. Uh, how was your holidays? Pretty good? It was good. It was relaxing. We, we were very intentional this year about where we were going and how we were going to do it because we just wanted to keep those good vibes. Uh, no, man, it was great. We, uh, we did a little bit different this year. We just bought the kids one big gift each, okay. and we called it. That was it. Nice. Easy breezy. We gave ourselves a $200 spending limit apiece, and we bought ourselves our own gifts. Take out the pressure, man. Yeah. And that right. was it. There's a lot of added stress on buying gifts for, uh, for family members, and uh, that's not how it should be. It shouldn't be. I think it takes away from what, what the, the season's for. and. So we're just pretty strict. We're pretty black and white about stuff like that, especially with the family, and they know it. So it's like we can get away with stuff like that where probably my other family members couldn't. And uh, how's your New Year's? Dog, quiet. I was in my bed by 9.30, just chilling. I had some some loud-ass firecrackers growing across the street, but outside of that, I was good. It was relaxing. Very nice. And you? I got out of my realm a little bit, stayed up a little late. Nah. Uh, Drank a little bit. I mean, something I don't do often, but it was good to a little bit of dysfunction, right? Yeah, we had the New Year's Day off, so that was nice to kind of just chill. Mm-hmm. Just recover from that. You set any goals? You no, said I, you, mean, you, I thought you were going to do something uh, with Ashley sitting down and. We did. Setting. I mean, listen, we're putting things together. We're like, what do what do we think is working and, and it's not working? I think one of the things for us is finding a better lifestyle when it comes to how much. Uh, how we're eating and how much we're training. Okay. And so, you know, like things that you've seen, like her switching off the car at 4.30 so I can take the kids, but she can come work out. That that has helped us a lot because we both, you know, feel like, you know, we, we're we helping each other out, trying to, you know, make health a priority. Uh, so keeping health a priority is huge for us, keeping that weight down, all that work we put in last year to lose that weight. Um, Find some new stuff for us to do, whether it's getting out a little bit more. I think that's important. We get so, uh, we're so routine kind of people. That's why I'm so successful, I believe. And uh, that routine, you know, is in my life too, in my in my private life. But we need a little bit more flexibility to be able to do a couple more things spontaneous. Uh, and I think that'll add a little bit more spice into our, our personal life for sure. Yeah, I was reading uh, in Tools of Titans. You got that book, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. I forgot who I stumbled across, but... Uh, they made a, a great point. It was like a quote. It was, um, winners make systems, losers make goals, right? Mm. So if you can kind of develop a system, like that being your main focus, you can either develop a skill and a habit that will translate long term. Now, if you just establish a goal, it's either a pass or fail mentality, sure. right? So you can't really take, um, you know, development and growth out of the equation if you were to fail at this goal, right? So the the focus should be developing a system instead of just a goal. Yeah, and um, yeah, I mean, it allows you to be more engaged in the process, I think, when you do that versus just like constantly thinking about the goal so much that it's infatuating, if not debilitating to your happiness, you know? And uh, I love the process. I love, we talked about that. We love training. We love this idea of, you know, trying new foods to see what could work or can't work for our diets and like we love all that part of the system of trying to be healthier people you know experimenting with different exercises or workouts um yeah we love that part not just like we don't just love the end of the workout we love the whole workout in itself right yeah i agree and i think people go wrong by uh, they think too long term too yeah. extreme too long term too far down the road maybe about a goal that would take you the entire year to uh, achieve. But if you focus on the short term, the day to day practices, the operations, the systems, I really think that's is what will deliver success in whatever you want to do. Dude, and that's a perfect transition for what we're trying to talk about today. You know, what, what, what we're finding is that, you know, really, you know, 80% of what we do is movement specialist stuff here, right? And that's, we got to get people to move well, really well, standardize that movement, and maintain that quality movement under duress and over time. There are just some movements that 
uh, people don't spend enough time in the process, right? Mm-hmm. Because they don't, they don't, th- they just want to be able to do something, but they don't want to put in the work that's required to do that thing really well. And we find that these are major limitations and people not just like, I think the mistake is that people are just saying that's a movement I can't do. It's a limitation. I just can never do that. But I look at it differently. Like it's it's awkward, right? It's awkward. I've never been able to do it. But the limitation really for me is I look big picture and it's your inability to do this is going to cap your Uh, ability to improve your fitness because these movements provide high quality fitness and you're not even close to even doing that movement so you are uh, without knowing limiting your fitness level because you're never going to train these movements and that's the shame for me not like oh like I want the dude practicing handstand five days a week that's not what I want it for as I feel like over time if they can improve the handstand and do it with such quality that will uh, exponentially improve their level of fitness yeah I think it comes down to committing to work on these things consistently and get them better it's human nature to avoid stuff we suck at Mm. and do stuff we're good at right so then it's up to you and I as coaches to set the stuff our members suck at and force them to do that, right? You and I joke all the time. You know, we probably wouldn't run unless it's in group class program. For sure, 100%. Because, right? you know, we don't like it. We dislike it. Why do we dislike it? Because we aren't good at it, yep. you know? So, you know, it comes down to setting a system in place to that forces us to work on our weaknesses so we can be well-rounded and improve our level of fitness like you just spoke on. Yeah, and I think number one, it, 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 it's about self awareness. Like when someone says, I didn't like that workout, what they're really saying is that workout have movements in them that I'm not good at. And so the self awareness has to come like, I didn't like that workout because I'm really not good at those. And it doesn't make me feel good when I'm not good at these movements. And once we can get through that and we're like, yeah, you're not good at this movement. Okay, what can we do to get you better at it and really take all the emotion and all that other stuff out of it? I think that we can move forward faster. Yeah, it, it's almost you got to get over the temporary discomfort for the long term gains, right? Uh, attacking a weakness and um, working on something you're terrible at is not comfortable, yeah. right? But if you come out on the other side a little bit better, that fulfillment of accomplishing getting better at a weakness, uh, you know, if you can kind of gather momentum like on that, uh, the, the rewards are there. You know, you, you feel very accomplished. Like, shit, I sucked at that yesterday but I committed to putting in the reps and I moved the needle just a little bit in the right direction. I'm like, I feel amazing. You know what I'm saying? That's huge. Yeah. I mean, uh, that's one of my favorite things to do as a coach is, is to remind them of where they were on day one, dude, you couldn't do five. Uh, you couldn't do 10 ring rows in a row when you first started and now you're doing strict banded or like, I think you got to create that awareness sometimes for them of how far, because like you said, they're so stuck on the goal of getting their, you know, uh, first kipping pull up that they're not enjoying that process and the journey through that. So sometimes we as coaches got to be like, dude, like you couldn't run a lap without stopping last time. And now you just ran a mile without stopping. So that kind of stuff is those little things that you're talking about that they can appreciate through that process, you know, because ultimately like, even if they finally get the first kipping pull up, they're going to move to a different goal Mm -hmm. and tour. And then when that next goal is five kipping pull ups, then it's, their first muscle up and so like it never ends and if if they can just recognize that then i can guarantee they'll appreciate the process more uh than than this kind of like i'll be happy when i get my first pull up it's just not gonna happen yeah you have to celebrate many wins right you have to celebrate many wins and a kind of philosophy i've been taking into uh helping our athletes develop these higher skill movements that they're not that good at is following up with a strength that they are good at mm-hmm. and the training session yeah. on a high note, right? Yeah. You know, if we're practicing double unders because you're terrible at double unders and you trip 50 times, we're not going to end on 50 trips, yeah. right? Yeah, no, yeah. Really. Hey, let, let's end. Uh, let's deadlift a little bit. You're super strong. It, it's deadlift is not a technical movement. Uh, let's, let's do that. And so you're leaving that training session uh, with that feeling of accomplishment, not that feeling of failure. 
Yeah, no, it's a really good point, and that uh, we always want to finish like that as well. It reminds me of an imam that we do. It's a goat imam, but what we do, the goat is, you know, basically just pick a movement that you're not good at, and we put that in the imam. We'll tell them to do 10 to 15 reps of that. But on the next minute, we're not going to give them to do another movement they suck at. They're just going to walk out depressed. So we say, give us one of your strengths mm -hmm. and that imam. So even though they're slower, not as fluid on that movement, they're not good at, they're going to come back with some confidence on that second minute and always, you know, build their confidence back up. And that's a, that kind of good sandwich that we like to kind of add to, to our training here. Yeah, I mean, you say it all the time. It's uh, – develop your weaknesses and make your strength stronger yeah right because you know keeping that strength in the picture is just you know still feeding keeping you confident making you still feel good it's a, it's a good formula to to work on both at the same time i agree 100 percent. so let's talk about these notorious difficult movements uh the, the obvious one to me i think uh takes the longest by far to develop is high quality unassisted pull-ups whether it's strict strict chest to bar, kipping, kipping chest to bar, the derivatives like the muscle ups. This is by far the longest journey for most people far removed from anything that looks like a pull up. Yeah, and I think it is, you know, firsthand you have to have the appropriate strength to body weight ratio, which you preach all the time. And, and that's step one. It doesn't matter, you know, how heavy of a bicep curl you can do or how heavy of, um, you know, a row or something, if you are overweight, you're going to struggle pulling your, you know, your weight up to the bar, right? You're going to struggle with pull-ups. So hand in hand, that's number one priority. That's where you have to be focused on is losing weight and decreasing your body fat percentage. Yeah. For me, strength to body weight ratio is purely based on lean mass. Um, it's rare that people that are overweight that don't have a lean mass can pull themselves up impressively enough to do anything with it. They just can't. And uh, I think we need to make that obvious. We need to do it in a, a it's loving manner. It's an uncomfortable conversation to uncomfortable. have, it needs to be done. It has to be, you know, and they're getting frustrated. And, you know, we have a one band policy rule. Like we're not going to put a member on the pull-up bar with more than one band. Mm -hmm. We're lying to them. And anyone else who's giving somebody more than a band is just – is just lying to them. They're doing them a disservice, right? They'll be on those same three bands for the next year. I can guarantee you that. So uh, we want to be honest there. We want to have logical progressions and regressions for how we move people. It's not a random regression, right? Every coach knows, like, we're going to move from this movement to this movement to this movement in that manner. We're not afraid to throw bicep curls in there. I think you want to get some their, somebody strong quick uh, for pulling strength. Get their bicep strength up, right? Get that ratio a little bit better. But no strength in the world is going to overcompensate for being overweight. And we just need to tie that conversation down with these individuals if they truly care about getting pull-ups. There's some people that would be happy with ring rows for the rest of their life. There's some people that, you know, my 77-year-old masters, what the hell does he need to be doing pull-ups for? Let him just stick to the ring rows and go from there. So we respect, you know, where the person is at in their life. But if you're 30 years old, there's no reason you can't do pull-ups. Mm -hmm. We can't train you in that direction. So uh, that's something that we always want to consider as well. Yeah, the best way to have that conversation on uh, you're too overweight to perform a pull-up is just go to the facts. Hey, you weigh 250 pounds. Imagine, you know, a 250-pound lat pull-down. You know, it, right. it's extremely heavy, right? So uh, we're not coming out and just saying, hey, you're fat, right? right. We're saying you weigh 250 pounds. Let's be realistic. Being here. able to pull 250 pounds is a very tough task. And chances are, if you are that overweight, it's not just the pull-up you're struggling with. You're struggling with all body weight gymnastic movements. You, yep. know? you are moving a heavier load than the people next to you, right? So, you know, first things first, hey, we weigh this. We need to get down to this. This will improve our gymnastics. Yeah, no. Um, and, and I think the other one, so one is being – just being honest and realistic and then two is going to be is consistency right with all these things we're going to talk about uh you're not going to get better doing it once in a while a week right so our most exciting part about our program is the most difficult about our program in that it takes 
a really long time to build mastery. If you're doing pure CrossFit the way the template is designed, you're touching one exercise a week and you might touch it the next week if you come to that class. Otherwise, it's two to three weeks before you touch the exercise. So if I'm on average a frequency of two to three times a month, maybe training the pull-up in a conditioning wad, you are never going to get better at them. And that's why we implement a skill in the week because we can stop under no duress and work that movement all week long. And that for us gives us more attention to these weaknesses than if we were just leaving it the way that most of these gyms are doing it, which is, yeah, we'll train the pull-up and give you the chance to train the pull-up in the wad when it comes up on that week. Hopefully it comes up that week. Yeah, and that's the worst way to develop a skill is do it under high duress. When you're gasping for air, you know, when you got uh, multiple other movements and tasks involved in the conditioning workout, that's the worst time to focus on developing something. You have to develop it on low intensity, you know, uh, low volume, mm. and just, you know, focus on one thing, getting better at one specific thing, and just, you know, stay dialed in. Yeah, I mean, this is a unique per perspective that I have, but I believe conditioning, uh, these wads, the way that they're created here sh is to show off your skill set, right? And that you can develop that skill set under low to no duress. And that's, you know, how I think about quality movement. Let's build them separately. Let's throw them in conditioning for the benefit of conditioning, but really it's to show off the quality and efficiency of my movement. It's not, I'm not trying to build high quality movement under duress. That's not what it does. They, they, it's very difficult for those to coexist at high intensity. So, um, you know, I'm very cognizant of that. Um, yeah, so pull up, man. Pull up is, is one that we, we see a big issue with. And then, you know, just kind of keeping in the gymnastic realm, the next one we can talk about is handstands, right? Same deal. If you are a little bit heavier and you're trying to kick yourself upside down and hold yourself with your, you know, your body weight upside down, you're going to struggle if you are super heavy. Yeah, there's no ifs, ands, buts about it. If we took that same load in a barbell press and we held it overhead, they could probably not hold it. And, you know, strength is by far the greatest limitation to that. They just can't maintain. They don't have the strength around their shoulder girdle to put to put all that weight on. And so uh, we're we're already behind there. You know, um, we can make some modifications by getting their feet on boxes and loading their hips slowly over their shoulders over time. But even that in itself doesn't fix the root issue, which is a severe gap between their strength to body weight ratios. And then on top of that, that's not really involved with the pull-up, in my opinion, is the lack of confidence to kick upside down, right? There's a, almost that fear setting. You know, a lot of people haven't been in a handstand prior to CrossFit, right? So there's that component of, you know, lacking confidence, that little bit of fear to kick upside down. And, you know, it's up to us as coaches to kind of get them pushed through that fear on, hey, I'm here spotting you. Let's do the reps here. Let's get you comfortable upside down, right? Because that's the first that's the first priority there is get comfortable upside down before you even attempt to try to do handstand push-ups or handstand walk mm -hmm. progressions later down the road. But, hey, let's try to overcome that, you know, lack of confidence, overcome that fear, and let's kick up, get a handstand. Yeah, and, you know, a, a great way to – the observation for that is if an athlete can, uh, you know, smoothly and efficiently do a wall walk at standard with belly to wall, and then all of a sudden you turn them around and they freeze as they try to kick up to the wall, we know it's a fear factor. And so showing them how we would spot safely, showing them how to bail appropriately, those things can help take that fear away a little bit because uh, I hate – I hate for somebody to have the prerequisites and have fear be the issue of why they can't kick upside down, right? Versus like, yeah, they're fearful, but they have all these other things that are holding them back anyways. But if they had the prerequisite strength, two for me, uh, it's clear, especially in men, is flexibility or the lack thereof. If they can't, they can't bring their biceps to ear in the standing position overhead with their hands overhead, without overcompensating at the spine or feeling like they're tugging, they're using all the energy to bring their arms overhead, that's going to be the same struggle they're going to have upside down, if not more. 
And so uh, we want to make sure that they can have the strength and the flexibility. But if they have those two there, man, I, it, it'd be a shame if fear is the only thing that's holding them back. And so as coaches, that's our job to help them overcome that fear, you know. And it can be tricky in group class. That's why it's nice to slow that down the way we do and skill of the week to give them a little bit more time. But when you're like, all right, we have handstands in the workout today. You never do it as a skill. You never stop for a little bit to work on it. And you're giving them five minutes to get their hand sensation set up. They're never going to get any better. They're never going to get it, dude. They're never going to get it. And that's why we spend so much time doing it the way we do it. Um, so I, I think also if somebody does lack the strength, one of the quickest and fastest ways to get them stronger is the barbell press. Mm -hmm. Let's get them standing. The motions are almost identical. And let's get them pressing some heavy weight overhead. overhead. I think even, like you said, that mindset, just the confidence of like, yeah, I mean, I'm pressing some good solid weight now. I'm ready for this handstand. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's for us. We're finding the fastest way to get people upside down. Yeah. And then, and your point on doing a wall walk, you know, belly to wall, Hey, you're establishing right then and there, you can hold your body weight upside down, right? So the fear is just the kick up from the right. floor to the wall. That's, that is what's scary. Uh, so, you know, just reassure them, Hey, I just watched you hold a perfect handstand for a decent amount of time. And in my opinion, it's harder to walk up into a wall mm. than simply just kicking upside down. Mm. You know, could you agree? Yeah, it's definitely more time under tension for sure. Yeah, you know, it's almost if you got a handstand already, you can kick up. You're waste, you know, you're almost wasting uh, effort and energy walking up to it. So hey, let's just get over this hump on kicking you up. I'm here. Let's get you up there. I'll spot you. You uh, won't fall. I you, promise. You will, I'll got exactly. you. Exactly. That's that's the greatest one. You know, you will not fall. I got you. Yeah. Right. I I'm here. Um, you know, I'm committed to keeping you up there. And then. You, know, you just got to go for it. You got to throw your hips, legs up at the wall. The wall's not going anywhere, mm, yeah. right? The wall's not going anywhere. You're not going to crash through the wall. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, so let's get you up there. You know, uh, I'm confident in your ability to do it. You got to be confident in your ability. No, that's really good. And it's just walking them through that. I think that, you know, that relationship that we build with them helps. Uh, we're just not random people coaching random coaches coaching random people, right? We know their names, we know their limitations, we know what they're working through. So mm -hmm. uh, that makes our life a little bit easier for sure. Um, three, um, running, running, man. This week's. This week's skill of the week. And it's still one of those things where like, you know, no matter how much time we spend on it, it's still, they're not spending enough time running, right? It's the same thing. You see the run in that, that day, that week, there's just not enough volume. You got good runners running five, 10 miles a session. We're running maybe a mile in a workout. It's just not enough volume to get the practice right, right? Uh, and so, uh, you know, the two limitations I see, they either don't even know how to run properly, right? They separate the skill from running they think it's just going from point A to point B. They think it's just, you know, moving their legs. And so we, we want to drill home how important the run is, just like we would the deadlift or the bench or the snatch. Uh, so going through pose running and the technique required to do that efficiently, safely, uh, run faster and longer. And then volume. People need to throw intervals in there. They need to... They need to, you know, get uncomfortable trying to go run two, three miles at home without stopping to really get some more practice with the technique. Uh, because, uh, again, if they're waiting for us to throw all that volume in, it's going to take a really, really long time for them to ever feel comfortable running. And it, this is super crucial because I feel like the margin for injury on running is, is there, right? It's high. Uh, so you have to really focus on running with proper technique or – you know, maybe not during the run, but afterwards, you're going to feel achy. You're going to, you know, if if you're going to develop shin splints, mm -hmm. right? And that's all lack of technique work. You know, it it's might not be a direct effect of your running, which it could be. You could, you know, hurt your knee during the midst of a run. But running technique is so crucial in running in general because the margin for – injury is there as opposed to pull up or handstands right mm -hmm. 
So it's that much more important for us to kind of focus on running as skill acquisition, just like any other movement we do in CrossFit. As soon as someone says, uh, you know, I hurt when I run, I immediately think they're doing something wrong. I don't ever say like, running is bad i think mm -hmm. it's a very ignorant statement like an olympic lifter is not going to say that the snatch is bad but someone who's never done the snatch looks at it and says that's a bad exercise right so i think they have to knowledge is power they have to be educated on the proper technique and why it's the proper technique not like because someone in high school told them that it's better to stride or that you should like you know what i mean and never ask the questions why should we do it this way right we don't just tell people how to pose we tell them why it's important to pose and why this technique makes so much sense yeah no i agree uh and then too i think the other ones that's really important here is like we do a lot of interval training here Interval training is really important for running. Uh, I'm not talking about like 110% of your, you know, RPE uh, uh, for exertion rate. We don't want them running that fast, especially here, but we do wanting we do want them to run at a challenging pace because we know that the running technique only works at a challenging pace. Otherwise you get into this, what I call the marathon shuffle where it's not running at all. It's this kind of, you're moving your legs, but you're not picking them up. You're heel striking. Uh, it's a terrible technique that they use because they recognize they're going to be on the road for the next 26 miles. Uh, most people who run fast naturally do pose. Mm -hmm. Because it's required to pull the legs, hit, strike underneath your hips. All that stuff happens naturally at fast speeds. We have to. We recognize that some people are out of shape. They can't maintain those fast speeds. So intervals are amazing because we can match their c current skills capacity to that high pose technique. Give them the rest they need to keep maintaining that. That practice over time builds volume. Their ability to do that technique longer and longer and longer before they do what? Everybody will always move, will revert back to bad technique when tired. Exactly. We as coaches need to recognize that's not f just for running, that's for everything, is when that happens. We call that threshold. And that everyone's got a threshold for every movement, every exercise, every load, every workout. Uh, that stuff we need to recognize. Hey, she runs that really well at 100 meters, but it, right she gets to that 200 meters, it gets she really sloppy it. again. Her intervals should be 100 meters for a while. And that's the game that we're playing with all athletes. The best athletes in the world have the highest threshold in the world. That's what makes them great athletes. So really just creating more awareness there and uh, about the quality of the technique, how long they can maintain the technique and put it in weekly, put it in weekly. Yeah, you set that fixed work to rest ratio when you are – having that rest time, it's an opportunity to kind of reflect on how your previous set went, right? Uh, you know, oh, I felt like, you know, I was too heavy on my heels during that last run. My next set of intervals, I'm going to focus up more on pulling than pushing. You set that rest time, not only is it an opportunity to kind of catch your breath, but it's also kind of reflect on what you could change, how you could get better. And you can't have that moment when you're, you know, balls to the wall, crazy intensity, you know right? You know, that all about you know what we talked about previously is you know school acquisition is based on you know the ability to reflect and go at our our pace um and make necessary changes as needed yeah it's not yelling at them when they're doing a workout it's taking the opportunity to see issues happening during the movement so when the break comes up you know exactly what to tell them so that's what a great coach does. I mean, in any sport, that's how it's done. Mm -hmm. They don't stop them in the middle of the play and say you're doing something <laughs> bad. They let the play right out. When the break happens, they tell them what they need to fix. That's make what adjustments. we're doing. You make adjustments. My favorite running interval we have here is run the straights, walk the sides. Run the straights, walk the sides for 10 minutes. So when they come up to the front, I know what to tell them. When they're passing me, hey, I'm looking. Hey, pull. Hey, more toes, higher cadence. Keep the feet underneath you. Like, you know. So, um, and I'm glad we do that, but um, it's still not enough. It's still not going to be enough if they're not putting this on the side. No, yeah, it, they have to put it on the side. They got to do it on their own. What's the last one? Uh, only lifting. And this is arguably the most technical of all, all, all four, right? And you can, you know, just draw at it all you can, all you can, and you'll never, ever reach perfection. Mm -hmm. No matter... You know, the top Oli lifters uh, spent two decades doing this, and they're still – they wish they could have got more weight. They wish they – right? They never said, that was it. That's all I had. Yeah, no, it's a constant, you know, process to 
it's it's lifelong it's lifelong trying to master the the olympic lifting the clean and jerk and snatch yeah i mean we had this combo with your client earlier and we just basically said that you and i have a huge advantage over him he's just he started doing cleans with you and w you know that's like three four years ago and we're like shoot we've been cleaning for the last 16 17 mm -hmm. years i didn't i was a freshman in high school so it's been 17 years since I started barbell cleaning, I have a huge, huge advantage over people who are coming to start their first snatch at 40 years old. We have a huge advantage. So I think for these individuals, we want them to have patience. We want them to recognize that this is going to take a while. This is not, you know, some of your easy barbell powerlifting movements like the back squat or easier, the back squat or the deadlift or the bench. Like, no, these are very technical movements that are going to take a lot of patience. And if you have limitations, they're going to take longer. Yeah. And the biggest limitation we see often is not really a lack of strength. It's a lack of mobility. If you have lack of mobility, you are going to struggle tremendously with the Olympic lifting. So before you grab a barbell and try to, you know, pursue this mastery of this Olympic lifting, you have to have the required range of motion to move through your muscles and joints to get in proper positioning yeah it, it, it's you know they're wasting energy before they even do a rep to have to maintain the bar in certain positions or uh it's it's exhausting before they even perform a rep right uh, one of my favorite things to do warm people up overhead is just to uh bring the bar overhead whether it's in the finish of the jerk or the finish of the s snatch the standing position of the snatch keep it overhead, and then I start talking. I give my coaching spiel. Mm -hmm. You notice I do that. I yep. do it for two or three minutes. I've been taking it Because from you. what I'm doing is I'm looking for the people that are starting to shake, that are starting to get the bar to move really fast, because those are the problematic, un unflexible people. Mm -hmm. Anyone can hold a tight, straight position for one second when they catch the bar overhead, but can you, at ease, hold that bar overhead without shaking for two or three minutes while I'm talking about the snatch or the clean and jerk? I know right away where my, my issue athletes are going to be today when we go to the finish, and uh, it goes back to unnecessary work. Like uh, Efficiency is doing the... Uh, wasting the least amount of energy, performing the most amount of work. That's efficient, right? And that movement overhead is very inefficient for them. We're not even performing a rep, and they're getting tired. And so, um, unfortunately, that issue takes years to resolve. Why? Because it took years to, to become an issue, mm -hmm. right? And so they have to be patient. We try to get creative with mobility drills. What I'm finding with mobility and stretching is that is. Really, everything that we should do is preparatory. It can get them how the most ideal loose position that we can get them for the training. But it's going to go right back to that at the end of the session. And so it's this constant flux, right? No one like, you know, I don't get a stiff athlete and then do some mobility drills and he's flexible as hell again. It's like a miracle. That never happens. We're working. We're fighting for a few degrees today and that's it. And hopefully that overhead looks better. And they just got to consume a lot of energy into that. And most people don't. They hate doing flexibility work. They, it's not sexy. It's dreadful. It's not sexy. It takes a lot of patience. People aren't patient anymore. They want to go do other stuff. They think it's not part of fitness. And it's really hard to sell that. I mean, we we're joking with Coach Luke. Coach Luke does about six hours of mo – no, six hours of mobility work a week. That's crazy. Right? And so – because he sees it as a priority and he's mm -hmm. the best mover in the gym by far. He's by far one of the best movers in the gym. Now, whether he, you know, that flexibility work has helped improve that or he's had it and the flexibility work has helped him keep it, I don't know. But he moves really well and we cannot say that that's not correlation of the mobility work that he's putting in. Yeah, and it doesn't have to stop just doing the extra stretching, you know, you know, on, on the back end, right? I feel like you'll get more bang for your buck if you grab a PVC pipe or an empty barbell and just sit in these Oli positions, right? You sit in the bottom of overhead squat. You know, you gave me this the other day. Sit in the bottom of overhead squat with a PVC pipe overhead and just sit there, right? Or like we do with the, yeah, with the 10 minute squat test. Yep. Yep. Or just, you know, grab an empty barbell, get in the front rack and sit in the bottom of a front squat, really jacking those elbows high forward, you know, getting them shoulders up into the barbell sit in these positions so now when you go to perform a squat clean right you just sat in a front squat for five minutes 
you're going to feel comfortable in that bottom position as opposed to stretching your hamstrings or ankles on the side for 20 minutes before class. Grab a barbell, grab a PVC pipe, master the finished positions of these lifts, and I feel like it'll be a little bit faster for you, and you'll get more bang for your buck on you know, getting better for – mobility in these positions yeah i think people make mobility a lot harder than it needs to be my my philosophy is really basic where are you tight stay there and hold there for a really long time and that will improve over time right that's it no it it makes complete sense you know we don't there's 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 great resources out there you know mobility wide with bands and all this fancy stuff are those great yes but at the end of the day starting point you know you are very novice at doing any mobility. You're super tight. Hey, let's just keep it as simple as possible. Find out the weaknesses and the positions you're at and just sit in that position. Yeah. But not even that, like you can't train with the band. You can't train with the lacrosse ball. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, it's you moving your body really, really well. Why don't you get your body in those positions where you don't move really well and hold those positions over time, right? Like when someone says, dude, I can't sit in an air, I can't sit in the bottom of the squat for 10 minutes, it hurts. Of course, because you're not mobile enough to hold those positions. That will improve over time. Start with a minute, then go to two, then the cramp comes at three minutes instead of one minute. And that's the game we're playing, but people wanna go from zero to hero. They wanna be like, I can't sit in the squat test for 10 minutes, I'm never gonna do it, and they give up. And uh, that's why they struggle. Uh, so flexibility is one. The one that I'm seeing too, I think, for especially non-former athletes, is speed. 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 There's Lack not enough speed. oomph, mm-hmm. violent, aggressive, whatever you want to call it, whatever word you want to use, so that it doesn't scare you. There's just not enough oomph in that movement. And I say that speed fixes the majority of most pieces people's ollie issues or the lack of speed. If you can just do this a little bit faster, you're going to extend your hips. If you can do that jerk a little bit faster, you're going to find yourself in the lockout. If you can uh, bring the bar to your hips from the snatch, that bar is going to fly overhead. But when you're doing it systematically slow on purpose or not even aware, you're never going to perform that to the, to the best of your abilities. Yeah, and then you start overthinking it. You start overcomplicating it and you're increasing the time for error, right? Hey, you know, that looks good. Just do a little bit faster, right? That's my my biggest cue right there. That looks good. Just do a little bit faster, and it corrects itself. Yeah, that's really good. And, um, you know, last but not least is that uh, the way to fix some of these uh, these movements is that if we take the these sna- uh, these Olympic movements as, as complex movements, that's what they are. They are complex because there's a lot of things going on. Is using a barbell complex that breaks down the movement into its pieces where you are weakest is by far I've seen the the fastest greatest improvement for people's weaknesses. Meaning, if your hip extension is your slowest part of the lift. Hang power cleans is a thing that you should be working at with a complex that builds into the power clean. If your jerk is the slowest, you should move into a complex with push press push jerks or things like that. That helps us just really put our eye on that limiting part of your snatch and put some more attention to it versus if the only way that you can get better at these movements is performing the full exercise every time and hoping that that's going to make you get better, you're gonna, you, it's going to take a very long time, my friend. Yeah, it, uh, you can kind of look at it as a series of checkpoints, right? A series of checkpoints. You know, my go-to uh, programming on trying to get our athletes better at stuff is the three-position clean or the three-position snatch. Oh, my favorite, yeah. You know, so if we just checkpoint, okay, got it. Next checkpoint, got it. Next checkpoint, got it. It's going to improve your technique tremendously. And just self-awareness. If I say, hey, what, what do you struggle here on the snatch? You should know. Right. We should be speaking, have the same vocabulary. We should be communicating the same language. Right. Not like this thing when I do it there, that thing that like, no, at the second pull, uh, I pull too early. Right. Uh, My setup uh, is not consistent. Uh, my finish needs work like that. We, so that helps us start the conversation. We're a lot deeper in the conversation than like, okay, no, this means clean. This means power. Like, uh, so, and that happens over time. We say that, I think that, uh, it's a huge learning curve because people, we need to speak the same language before I can make huge change in people's lives. 
No, I agree. Well, thanks, brother. Thank you for your time. Thanks for listening, guys. We're happy to be back, and we can't wait to, to just bring that fire this no, year again. No doubt. New year, new us. <laughs> new year, new us. New year, new you. Thanks, okay. guys. Thanks, guys.